Galatians, in Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> and um, this morning I want to talk about three stages of your harvest field. Three stages of your harvest field. <clears throat> A lot of times when we think of the harvest field or when it's taught, we're always thinking in terms of that usually we think in terms of the end time, like there's going to be at the end of all this, there's going to be this great big harvest of souls, and all these people are going to get saved and everything. <clears throat> and of course, you know, and I've heard that taught over and over, and it's a really, really big and common teaching, and most people hold that. I, um, <clears throat> um, I've always had, personally, I've always had a hard time with that because a harvest usually is the end of seed planting. You, or there's a season way earlier than that where you're putting seeds in the ground and the seed is receiving Christ. Right? I mean, that's receiving the seed into the ground. That's what it says in Matthew 13. There's your, there you're getting the seed in the ground. And then there's this long period of time where the seed grows within the ground. And then it comes forth out of that ground. <clears throat> And so I've always sort of had a hard time with the harvest field being a, a, it would almost be like a great harvest of putting seed in the ground is the way they describe it, you know, but it's not. It would be the result of the seed that was, had already been in the ground for a good period of time, uh, having received Jesus long before that. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not going to get too much into that, but I, want, I do want <clears throat> to just begin to sort of look at uh, a couple of stages that I've just been meditating on, and it's it's not a, uh, <clears throat> I don't know that it's a teaching or whatever as much as a meditation this morning, um, a meditation from my heart to comprehend what the Lord's doing in me and what the Lord's doing in you, and to comprehend what his, uh, <clears throat> what that work is going to look like and how it's going to progress and the effect that it's going to have on God and on others and and a lot of times when I'm searching things I tend to I don't I don't try to as much anymore it, it comes more natural because I I do it but I tend to want to see the effect on Jesus instead of just us in other words how is this affecting the Lord or how is this affecting the kingdom rather than how is this making my life more Christian or how is this making my life more comfortable or whatever. And, <clears throat> and I, I think there's value in that because I think that when it's all said and done, it's about, you know, I mean, when you, when, you know, we, we look at this picture of, well, we're all going to stand before the Lord one day, you know. What is it, you know, in that picture, what is that, what do we think that's going to be about? It's going to be what he thinks has satisfied him and what had. You kind of see what I'm saying. It, it, it's, it's not going to be, well, you know, we all stand before the Lord. Let's talk about all the good stuff that satisfied us while we were down there. I mean, you know, and I remember the time I went to Six Flags for free. And, you know, I mean, you know, he's going to go, what is that? You know, or, or you, you kind of see what I'm saying. So. I try to evaluate things in light of reality instead of in light of uh, human futility, which is just trying to make us happy on this earth. All right, so uh, give, if you'll give me just a second here, I'll try to draw out a little bit. I hadn't thought it out too much, <clears throat> but um, I've kind of right at this point got this at three stages. And so we'll just mark a, a beginning of the harvest, and then I'll mark that by cross, and then we'll go into another phase, and then uh, I haven't really thought through too much down here <clears throat> uh, as far as exactly the end, because it's not the end that I'm looking for, um, because it would be ridiculous to spend time trying to figure out and to contemplate the end when the process is what brings about the end. If you plant wheat seed, you get wheat seed in the end. 
So the process would be planting, making sure you got the right seed, making sure the ground's good. In other words, your end is assured by what you're doing in the process. You see what I'm saying? So, but most Christians are all thinking about the end. Oh, it's the end. Well, I hope it turns out good. Well, you know, maybe you ought to try planting the right stuff. You see what I'm saying? And be involved in that. <clears throat> and I found this scripture here in Galatians. It's Galatians 6, verse 7 through 9. Interesting, uh, this time around, based on, a, on sort of a uh, wording that it has here. <clears throat> Most of us sort of avoid this scripture, or we get into it and we stop and we go, I think I'll read somewhere else. It's only three verses. <clears throat> it's only three verses. But uh, verse 7, be not deceived. Okay, oh boy, we're already in trouble. <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> because apparently there's a deception in relationship to the harvest, which you wouldn't think, but apparently there is. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. It just got worse. You know, I mean, be, us being deceived, one thing, mocking God, that's starting to tread on dangerous territory. <clears throat> Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever or whatsoever, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. All right, and the example of that that I think of is <clears throat> electricity. You know, you have a plug in the wall and, and uh, you, maybe you're young and you don't understand it and you're sitting there playing with a fork or something. You go, I wonder what would happen if I stick this fork into that plug. I wonder, you know? I mean, it's a nice little thing. I've never thought about this. And you go, well, you know, and you're, you're shocked, you know. I am shocked at this, at the result. And, and the thing to realize is not to go into some sort of fear like, electricity hates me. I've seen people plug stuff in there and it's been fine and they've never got hurt, but electricity is out to get me. <clears throat> Which, while we may not see that too often in reality, we see it spiritually. Where somebody goes against the laws of God, gets a negative result, and wonders why God is out to get them. I never saw God do this to them, you know. Why did I get this shock? Why does this jolt come right now? Why is this happening? What is going on? Da, 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 all this stuff. And going off on all this stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with there are laws set before you ever existed that, you know, and electricity before it was even discovered was still true. There are ways to work with it, and there are ways not to work with it. Sowing and reaping there are things to sow and there are things that you should try to avoid not sowing. And, and, if, you, and if you sow the wrong stuff, you're going to get a harvest from it. It's just the way it is. You can, you can say, well, this ground hates me. This earth hates me. God hates me. You know. But it's, it has nothing to do with that. <clears throat> so, Saying God's not mocked. This is just the way it is. I mean, it's, it's set in motion. He doesn't do it every time. He doesn't sit up there and wait for somebody to stick their finger in a plug or something. You know, and go, ha, ha, do it. You know. <clears throat> it's all set in motion. And the question is, how, do, how will we respond with the flow of the Lord? How will we respond with the way God set it all up? He's, yes, he did set it up that way. And our goal is to be with the Lord, <clears throat> find his mind on these things, and quit making everything so personal all the time. <clears throat> all right, so, um, so it goes on to say, For whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap what? All right, so <clears throat> guess what? You know, we can say, we can, we can make a contrast here. I don't know, I'm gonna, uh, this is probably... I'm just coming off the top of my head. Let's say that we like tangerines, so we plant tangerine seeds, and then a little tree grows, and it brings forth tangerines, and we go, oh, I like this. But let's say, let's just say we don't like grapefruit, and I know some of you love grapefruit, and you live to eat grapefruit, but let's make it a negative fruit for right now. 
<coughs> because it was for me, it still is. <coughs> um, you know, so you get this big field of, of grapefruit trees and everything, you go and, it's all, life is sour! Life is so bitter! Well, you know, why'd you put all them seeds in the ground? You know what I mean? Life is not bitter, you're dummy. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, think, I'm just, help me, help me think through it. It's not, you know, it's not the seeds we put in the ground fault either. It's that we put those in the ground and we said, this is the harvest that I want. No, no, I wouldn't say that. Well, then you need to figure out that whatsoever man soweth that will he also reap. Okay, that's, all right. <clears throat> all right. But now an interesting turn. The next scripture brings a totally interesting turn. I, mean, I just love the Lord. He's just, he just messes with us, you know. And it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. <clears throat> now here's my take on this so far. The first two verses says, Don't be mocking God. If you sow junk, you're going to get junk. Next verse. If you sow to the flesh, corruption, baby, it's coming. You can try to ignore it and whatever, but it's coming. And then he says, well, let's not be weary in well-doing. We, we're going to reap. Well, you just said we're going to reap, but it didn't sound so good. Do you see, do you kind of follow the scripture there? You know, ninth verse all of a sudden goes, hey, don't, get, don't be weary. We're going to reap if we faint not. And we're going, I'm fainting now knowing what I've sown. So I, I began to try to contemplate this process. And I have the beginning process here in relationship to the point where we get saved. All right, so this first point, we'll just call it salvation. Or, or, or well, where we start, and it goes down to salvation. So let's just call this whole area between the first point and the cross, let's just call that the period of sowing before we knew the Lord. Let's call it that. Okay, so let's remove this. The period from birth till we meet Jesus. <clears throat> All right. Now there's a wonderful, a wonderful aspect that happens in this first phase. It is a wonderful aspect because you can spend your whole life sowing garbage because you're not born again, sowing bad and evil. Anybody do anything before you came to the Lord that probably, you know, should have brought some bad stuff your way, like eternal fire and brimstone or something. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think of something. That, you know, yeah. Um, and, and yet there is this in this, I'm going to put it like this, there is in this package this first phase of uh, three phases of, of, the, of our harvest, this first phase where all of a sudden whatever happens, you end up having an encounter with the Lord and you realize that, you know what, I haven't really been a very good person and I have really done some stuff wrong and my God, you know, I'm, I deserve hell and I'm probably going to spend eternity in hell and Jesus, would you save me? And he said, yes, and that, but then there's this recognition. How are you going to save me from my harvest? And he says, everything that you sowed, all of... Um, all of the bad stuff that you sowed, all of the yucky things that, have, that are coming up and that are coming up with bad fruit on it and all this stuff, I personally am going to take that into myself and where you deserved, you know, you deserve to be brutalized as it were, I'm going to be brutalized for you. And I don't deserve it because I didn't do that. But I'm going to bear your whole harvest. All right. Oh, my God. At the end of that phase right here, as, as uh, we can say it like this, as we walk a few steps past the cross, we feel clean. We feel 
free. We feel alive. We feel like, oh my God, I, I love you, Jesus. I love you. I love that you died for me. I love your way. I love all of this. I deserved all of that harvest, and yet you took the whole thing so that I could be free, so that I could live, so that I could be with you. Anybody feel that? I mean, I, I did and do. When I came to the Lord, it was like, oh my God. I mean, <clears throat> you know, a lot of stuff in my, my family and everything, there was a lot of darkness and a lot of really, really, really bad stuff, you know. I mean, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but, <clears throat> you know, when I was 11 years old, I was put on Valium, which is really powerful for an 11-year-old kid. But I was put on Valium because my hands, I couldn't not hold them still. My nerves and everything were shot, and the whole lifestyle and things that were swirling all the time, never-ending, <clears throat> And when I found Jesus, when Jesus found me, that stopped. I was off Valium, and I, it stopped, you know. <clears throat> and, and it stopped because in my view of things, all of this harvest and all of the filth and all the dirt and all the hurt and all of the junk and all of the things that have been said and all of the actions that have been taken, it was just wiped away. It was just wiped away. Glory to God, you know. All right. <clears throat> so most of us are familiar with that, with that phase. All right. So the next, the next phase, I will call, I, I'll say the problem here was, was us. Okay. This next phase really is sort of basically what we do. Let's see. Maybe I should just do that. Okay. So from the cross out to here, we're marking a... Da -da. I'm sorry. We're marking a, <laughs> a phase here that we're now we're saved and now we do understand the scripture here and it, the scripture says you will reap what you sow, but here's what we're thinking now. Here's what we're thinking in this next phase. All right. Now, we know Jesus forgives, okay? But we're, we're as it were, dragging part of this first phase into this second one. But we can read this scripture right here in Galatians 6, 7, and 8 and realize that he's talking to Christians, if you sow to your flesh, you're going to reap corruption. That's going to happen, Christians, because it's a law. Amen? All right. But wait a minute. I thought Jesus, he did. Okay, so, so, so let's, let's try to fuse the two of them but see the differences also. We get over here in this phase, and in the second phase, we are primarily concerned with certain things that we do. Let's call them sins. Okay? All right. So, the process, we move, into this, we move into this second phase. We get down the road here, and we do something wrong. We sin. We fail God, and we do something. And we are aware that like Jesus did in the big, big picture in the first phase, he will do on a smaller scale every day he will bear away my sins and the harvest that I should get from it, right? The difference is instead of storing it up from birth till we get saved and just flopping this whole big ugly thing in his lap and saying, forgive me, now we're sort of walking with him and when we do something wrong, we sin, we fail or whatever, we realize I can take this bad seed right now to him, amen? Okay, so, so we do that, and we're doing that a lot, and so along the way, along this second phase, we're going to have, uh, uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, good things that we're sowing, you know, along that way, and they're going to be uh, of God, and so we're sowing some good seed and stuff, but we're also going to have some junk, 
And my, some of it, a lot of it, we're going to cover the junk, the bad harvest in the second phase. We're going to cover it by the blood of Jesus. Okay? And we're going to, we're going to, there's an old saying, keep short accounts. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So far, this is just basic stuff. This shouldn't be surprising to anybody. <clears throat> All right. Now we're going to get down into this third, third uh, uh, phase, and we're going to talk about what others do. All right. And that is, after salvation and after being a Christian a while and after getting, uh, getting it settled um, in our um, walk that, you know, when I sin... When I do something bad, I'm going to get it under the blood. In other words, I'm going to stop the harvest, the bad seed from coming up and filling my life. You understand? <clears throat> but as we get down the road and as we get older, there's a new phase that begins to happen. And that new phase, as we enter in, it has to do with us, what others do to us. It ha it's no longer really an issue about us sinning and getting forgiveness. We just start living life. We just start going about regular old life. And going about regular old life, somebody does something to us. Somebody hurts our feelings. Somebody crosses us. Somebody treats us unfairly. Somebody does something to us. And in this phase... We're not as aware of reaping and sowing at all. In fact, if anything, if anything, we're more aware that they did something wrong, so God will get you for that. God will get you for that. All right. But we have no idea what's going on on the inside of us, which is sinning against the nature of Christ, sinning against the cross, sinning against the resurrection, sinning against everything that Jesus stands for now, as opposed to just dying for our sins, everything that he stands for now, we are crossing the line in a bigger way than we ever did along the whole thing. And that is, the line is Christ and him, being one with him, being, being out from him, being his branches, you know, I was thinking about that the other day, a simple, spray, a simple thought. But, you know, Jesus, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And, and I just thought of it just him, Jesus saying, I'm the vine, like it, as if he were just talking to me. I'm the vine, you're a branch. You're a branch. You're not a Christian. Your whole existence... It's just be so connected to me, abiding, so connected to me that what's in me comes in you, and what's in you, which is me, comes out of you in terms of harvest, fruit, harvest. All right. All right, well, we know that. Praise God, you know, glory to God. You know, we're deep. We know stuff. <clears throat> but what we don't know is that when we get hurt, when, when somebody does something to us, when somebody wrongs us, there is a reaction in us that is oblivious. It is as if you are deceived. As it is as if that you actually would mock God on this thing that you're going to still reap what you sow. You say, well, is that talking about down here in the end? Am I going to go to hell? Am I going to stand before a big throne? Is God going to hit me with all the stuff? Is he going to flash it all before my eyes? No, the, the corruption is going to happen in your life while you're sowing. You're, you're, you know, the example that the Lord showed me years ago <clears throat> was, you know, uh, and I think, the, I think the class, the course was called The Law of Seed, Time, and Harvest. But the way the Lord showed that thing to me was really powerful because the Lord said, you know, uh, how would you like to predict your future? Yeah. Well, you know, that sounds scary. You know, that's, well, you know, I don't want to go to no witches or anything. 
but, but sowing and reaping predicts your future. Whatever you, it's like he's saying right now, Randy, right now, right this minute, you can totally predict your future depending on what you choose to sow. Right now. Not tomorrow, not, you know, you're, well, it's too much. No, no, no. Right now. <clears throat> and then he gave me a picture of my, you know, not this first phase, but the second phase or whatever, where you still sowed a lot of bad stuff, and all of a sudden you realize all this, a new harvest is going to come up, just like it did when I was unsaved, but now I'm still going to get, because I've been sowing a bunch of stuff, what, what can I do? And the Lord just very simply said to me, we start putting the right seed in the ground and stop sowing the other kind of seed. And if you'll do that, if you'll do that, eventually, because you quit sowing the bad seed, the, all that, those stubble and rubble and, and, and briars and all that stuff, the bad stuff that's been coming up, all that will slowly decrease and you will increase Christ, yeah, that you're putting in the ground. And there will be, eventually, it'll overtake the bad harvest. You see what I mean? It's like scales. You know, you look at it right now and you go, oh my God, you know, I've got all this weight of this junk and how will I ever get out of it? And what? Ah, there's no hope for me. <clears throat> well, there is hope for you and that hope is Christ. <clears throat> and that hope is <clears throat> that, that eventually we begin to recognize the real issues once we get past this phase here. And the real issue is <clears throat> not what we're doing wrong, ultimately, but how insensitive, or as it were, how we mock, Christ crucified. <clears throat> All right. Well, we would never do that intentionally. I don't, I mean, I don't think we do. I don't think it's intentional. I think be not deceived. I think there's a deception that happens because we are, we have moved from trying to please him. We've moved from trying to know him in a real way. We're still religious about it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Do you want to know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I read my Bible at least once every Well, you know, pretty often. <clears throat> well, we know religiously there's no merit in reading the Bible. There's only merit in our heart if we want the Lord. Amen. You know, well, I don't want to get too far off, so I'll read my Bible. But you're probably getting further off because you're, well, you're becoming a Pharisee. <clears throat> Your heart is not right towards the Lord. <clears throat> well, I don't want to get too close to the Lord because he'll talk to me about you know, it's not about what others do. It's about my response to what others do. You know. <clears throat> and so-and-so hurt me, and I'm not going to forgive them. <clears throat> well, okay. Bless you. And... And, and it's usually not so-and-so hurt me and I'm not going to forgive them. It's usually <clears throat> they consistently hurt me. Okay. So I, I can't, let's see if I, can, if I can communicate this. The Lord gave me a picture. The Holy Spirit gave me a picture. And it was like <clears throat> in this first phase, we did all this wrong. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, Jesus said, turn the other cheek and go the extra mile and stuff. So, 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 so when the time comes to reap the harvest, Jesus stands there. He's on the cross. And we, or whatever, in relationship to our failures and sins, we come up to Jesus and we, <coughs> we slap him because we deserve that slap. He's going to bear that. You kind of understand what I'm saying? That he's going to bear the harvest in our place at this first phase, right? At the cross. Okay. So, bam, and, and shove a spear in his side and curse him and <clears throat> let fly all this stuff. And, and we're good with that. 
<clears throat> We're good with that. Most Christians are really good with that. You know, sure, let Jesus, let Jesus handle that question. Okay, that's fine. <clears throat> but then we get born again, there's this cross, and on the other side of that, however far we go, <clears throat> there, there's a new expectation, and that new expectation is that there be an increase of Christ, not just an increase of knowledge. You know, oh, I, I know deeper stuff. Have you changed? No, not at all. Is there, is there an increase of Christ, or is in there an increase of the knowledge of Christ? There's an increase of the knowledge of Christ. Does it really affect you or change anything? Not really, other than I have security that I can continue to sow bad seeds. Anybody following this? Still glad the storm didn't drive us out this morning. <clears throat> and um, and so, <clears throat> but here's here's what I'm trying to communicate. I, I saw in sort of a picture from the Holy Spirit that Jesus had a different attitude this time. <clears throat> because once we get down here in this third phase, we're reacting constantly to other people. To others, to what they did or what they said or what they didn't do. Amen. <clears throat> and we're sowing bad seeds. <clears throat> now, let, let, let me put it like this. Let me try to paint it. What we did up here in this first phase at the end, when we wanted to escape all of the bad stuff that we did, we laid it on Jesus. So, again, we slapped him. We shove a spear in his side. We curse him. We lay everything on him. And, you know, the beauty of Jesus is... That he says, I love you. I'm for you. Lay it on me. I'd rather take it for you. I mean, that's our Jesus. That's his spirit. And, and he will take it over and over. But, but you get down this road here, and we're, we're no longer following this spirit. And we get into this. And now when somebody, we remember, maybe it was six months ago, the last time they heard us or did something. <clears throat> um, and then just off the cuff, they say something. And we, in spirit, bam, we slap them. And then we go out, and we're in another situation with another person, and there's unforgiveness. And we take a spear, you know, they say some little remark, and we go, I'm not going to sit here and take that little remark. I'm going to shove a big spear into them. Huh. Okay. So we're, get, we're getting in a habit here, you understand? And we're sowing, and we're, we're deceived about sowing now. We don't realize we think it's justified. That's right. <clears throat> All right. Jesus is no longer okay with that. <clears throat> no, no, no. Why? Why, though? Why? <clears throat> because, because if in this phase he would take it for you, in this phase you're not putting it on him. Right. So he sees, <clears throat> you know, in this phase... <clears throat> In the first phase, it's like, here's the way I was trying to, uh, it was sort of coming to me, <clears throat> is that we're like Jesus in a certain sense, uh, and the Pharisees <clears throat> have brutalized Jesus, okay? So, um, you know, people have done me wrong, and people have, people are unjust, and people are... Uh, all, all this stuff, <clears throat> but I'm with Jesus. But down in this phase, it's like, oh, Lord, help me. It's like we're, it's like we're the Pharisees now. Before, they were the bad guys mistreating us. But now we're reacting all the time. And we're the Pharisees, and we're the brutalizers, and we're the power mongers, and we're the, you know, we were the weak up here, and we came to Jesus in weakness and frailty and said, Lord, help me. I'm, t I'm just, I don't deserve it, but help me. And Jesus in his, and as well as wonderful being of who he is, takes us up, and he bears all of that, and he takes us up, and he covers us, because that's Jesus. Amen? And we all know that. That's the Jesus we love. All right. But we get down over here, and now we're the Pharisee, and now we've got some strength, and now we don't like this, and now we're, we're Herod doing this, and we're Pilate doing this, and we're, and we're, we're, 
you know, and of course we don't see it like that <clears throat> because we see them as still that. But our reactions are, you know, they, they smote Jesus. You know, he said, turn the other cheek. So he, you know, turns the other cheek. We're smiting back, but we're smiting, we're trying to smite back harder. Harder. You did this to me? Oh, look, you know, I'm going to put up with this. Can anybody see a bad harvest coming? <clears throat> bad harvest. All right. So Jesus is having a hard time. Thank you. Jesus is having a hard time with it down at this third phase because he's still willing to bear every bit of that. He's still willing. And he's having a hard time because we, the ones that he's loving and trying to protect, we're the ones striking out at somebody else and we're slapping them and we're doing all this spear stabbing into them. And he's had that same protective spirit as a shepherd over sheep that he had over you here. Yeah. He's having over them now. Yeah. You know, he's kind of going, this is not okay with me. Hit me. Hit me. But don't hit them. Well, we were, we were sort of in this middle phase, remember, we were sort of letting it hit him. You know, we would sin, and then we'd say, forgive us. But when we said, forgive me, we knew that still you reap what you sow. It's just that Jesus is going to take it. Lord, forgive me. And he doesn't, just, he doesn't just sit on a throne and go, well, that was a pretty bad thing you did, but all right. It's okay. You know, and that's not how this thing works. He goes, I, I bore that punishment. I bore that reaping that you sowed, okay, myself, for you. All right. <clears throat> so he's, he's okay with that. That's, that's, that's Jesus. That's the Jesus that most people know. But the Jesus that, that we get deceived concerning is we don't realize <clears throat> that once we take the, um, the um, offense, isn't that, isn't that an interesting word? It's a dual meaning. Mm -hmm. Once we take the offense, we take up the offense. And we become offensive yes. in it. And we, we hold the offense that they did to us and we respond on the offense to strike back only harder, you know. <clears throat> and this can be any number of things. You know, we're, we're talking about certain phases. There's so, so many aspects of this that I, I can't even spell it all out for you. Excuse me while I finish communion. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to get, you know, here's, here's one under there from angle. I'm trying to get something done. <clears throat> and you're stopping me. This, this is, uh, the Lord reminded me of this <clears throat> a lot in my early days, especially in Bible school. <clears throat> when I went to Bible school uh, at Berean, when I went to Bible school, <clears throat> I went there to learn the Bible and to know Jesus. I wanted to set aside time to get into the word, to know the scriptures, and then to know the Lord, and then to have God work in me in such a way that I'd be useful <clears throat> later when I graduated and went out in ministry. Berean was the most horrible Bible school to that end. They never gave, I mean, they worked you, they kept you going. They never, you know, they said, okay, you, you know, Berean, the name comes from Acts 17, 11, where it says they, they of, they of uh, Berea were more noble than they of Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to find out what things were true that were being taught. <clears throat> well, great name. But they never gave you any time to. They told you to. They said, this is what we're about. 
But every time that I got a little bit of time to seek Jesus, I would be in my little cubicle room, my dorm little room. I mean, it was just like with no roof and, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it's in a warehouse. When I say no roof, it's a big warehouse, big roof up there, but all the, you could look over everybody, you know. It's like a prisoner of war camp or something. <clears throat> And you could hear everything and noise and all this stuff. Every time I got a little bit of time to get in there, and I mean, I would curl up. I'd get under the, I'd hide, man. I'd wanted Jesus, and I wanted to search the scriptures. They'd come in, somebody would bust through the front door, and all they'd have to do is, we need some people to help dig some ditches out here to do this or that or do whatever. And I'm going, I ain't saying I'm here. I'm not here. <clears throat> I mean it. And I remember over and over and over getting frustrated frustrated, you know, to the point of angry at times, frustrated, I would go, what is wrong with you people? We're supposed to be getting Jesus in this place. You're, you know, and you're, you're always interrupting the word and the spirit of God, and you people are out of whack with the Lord. This place is of Satan. <laughs> and you know what? I felt justified in reacting that. Because I wanted the Lord. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody see the contrast of, well, I want the Lord, but I, I'm willing to go with the devil to get him? <laughs> yeah. And so, and, and I mean, I was in sincere, and I mean, that happened a, for a long time, for a lot of years, because when I because after, after graduating from Bible school, Deb and I ended up got, getting married, and then we went to the mission field together, and we're on the mission field. And it was worse. It was. It was worse. I mean, I became the pastor of three churches, wasn't it? Three churches. The main teacher in the Bible school. We had an orphanage. I was over all the boys in the orphanage, getting them up in the morning, getting them to bed at night, clothes, doing all this kind of stuff. We got up at 5 in the morning, was it? Five. Okay, so it was early, though. We went to bed at least midnight or later. Me and Deb were newlyweds. We didn't even sit at the same dining room table. We had all these orphans and everything uh, for every meal. And she was over there so she could watch those kids. And I was over here, you know, brand new newlyweds. I'm going, hi, you know, remember, you know. <clears throat> That's where I, every once in a while you might see us do this little thing. We still do it, and that, that'll be, we'll look across the room because we're busy and we can't see each other, and we'll both start doing this thing. <laughs> Overtly. You know, she'll do it back to me, and we'll laugh and go on. We, we, go, we know what that means. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> um, went to the mission field, and it's even worse, and I'm going, look, now I'm in the ministry. I need Jesus. What is wrong with you people? What is wrong with you Christians? What is wrong with you Jesus? What is, something is out of, it's chaos, rules the universe. I just want a little peace. <clears throat> peace, peace, and there is no peace. To the soul, to the soul. To the, to the flesh, because even in that, I was being ruled by my flesh. I was letting, I was sowing stuff and, call, and, and not even seeing it as sowing something that I'm going to reap later from. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, that, when you get down in these phases, down at the latter end of this thing, it, that's where the deception starts coming because we think we're doing good and everybody else is messed up. <clears throat> All right. So, um, let me just, I hadn't even looked at any of this that I wrote down here. <clears throat> um, I said, people perceive the, the harvest in two ways. They see it once at the end of everything or they don't really believe it. And here's why I wrote that. I really, I mean, and you can all, I say stuff all the time that you disagree with. You never tell me. And I'm okay with that. Because I don't think that I've got, well, I don't think I know it all. And I don't think everything I say that comes out of my mouth is pure anything other than maybe <clears throat> something else. But 
But I do, I do really kind of believe this, that I don't think most of us really believe we reap what we sow. Because if, we, if all of us really sincerely did, we'd really watch what we say, do, attitudes, all this stuff. And, and if, there was, if we could have a, a um, reaping monitor, you know, like on our arm or something like that, you know, and you go, uh, can't you just, da -da 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 okay, it's going to be 7.2 increase of your harvest of corruption coming your way. And that was just one little event during the day. I mean, are you getting, you know, I mean, it'd be, what, don't, wouldn't you think that would be good? It might help us. Yeah, that's right. Boop, 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 boop. What? Why did I do now? <laughs> You're deceived. You're deceived. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? There is a monitor, and it's the Holy Spirit. But that was the point I was trying to say is by the time we get down here, we've gotten insensitive to the Lord. We're more sensitive to us, to what hurts us. Well, they did so and so to me. Well, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in you right now? Where's, what's important to you? Yeah, but it's always, it, it just never ends because the problem is our heart has gotten hard and we don't know it. Or, or let me just say it like this. Our heart has gotten cold instead of saying hard. It's gotten cold towards the Lord. But you know and I know that every time in our life that we've ever, our heart has gotten cold towards the Lord, we didn't know it. But the way to tell is we become preoccupied with ourself, our own hurts, our own wrongs that people have done. Are y'all kind of following that? We've, we've, we've really become self-absorbed with, you know, what's wrong with all these people. All right, so uh, then I said, I don't think we really believe that we reap what we sow, because if we really believed it, then we would watch that a whole lot more, amen? Mm -hmm. I mean, that'd be a big deal. I put down, they think what happens to them is either random, the devil, God, mean people, or bad luck. <laughs> now think about that, okay. Now I know, and I do know that there are, there are, these factors all play in. But none of them ultimately play into the fact that whatever harvest comes our way, we sowed it. Do you, are you getting that? That if you put wheat seed in the ground, you're going to get wheat seed. If you put grapefruit seed in the ground, you're going to get grapefruit. Nobody's doing that to you. You know, uh, you know. But by not understanding the harvest, we remove all responsibility from ourselves so that we can blame the devil or my husband or my this or that or, you know what I mean, my unruly child or my, you know, whatever. I don't know. <clears throat> um, and then I put down, they wanted their life to be better, but I couldn't do anything about it. I, you know. Now, let's, you know, maybe we'll just go for another hour on this, baby. What do you think? <clears throat> You know, I'm thinking now, I remember there was a spoof on Saturday Night Live, and it was, what has happened to your life now? And it's this game show. And so they bring on these people, and the, the guy says, uh, okay, Bob, he goes down the line of three contestants and something, Bob, you, you graduated summa cum laude in your class, and da 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 yeah, you know, and, and uh, you were, uh, you know, this next person was, you were, you were a cheerleader, or this and that, and the next person, they go down. So they talk to the three contestants, and then they say, okay, let's start with Bob, Bob. You know, now, right now, you're, um, you're selling insurance, and uh, you're at the bottom of the salespeople, and uh, you're sitting in a little office that doesn't even have a window and stuff like that, and, and, uh, w um, and so, so uh, you know, they're going over all the stuff that is killing him in his office when he sits there and going... You know, that, that in the game show, he's going, yay, this is going to be fun. And then it's not fun because he's finding out, what the heck happened to my life? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, don't you think that happens to a lot of people? 
you know, there was a show the other day I was watching, and, the, and this, this guy is this FBI agent, and he's having to keep everything from his wife and everything, and he comes in late and all this stuff, and work is taking him all this stuff, and she was still pretty and all this kind of stuff, and she was still wanting intimacy, and by the time he gets there, he's too tired, and their whole life, and the kids are already half grown and but not out of the house and and so finally she's fed up and she goes out and she gets drunk and she comes you know back home drunk and it's one o'clock in the morning she's sitting there still drinking and he walks in and she unloads and unleashes on him just lays all this junk on him with everything that she's got and she said what? oh i wish i could remember the exact words it was like she said why did you do this to my life? Because she had an idea of what her life was going to be. Why did you, why did you ruin my life? Why did you, all that I thought this was going to be? You. Okay. Folks, you reap what you sow. You know. You do. You reap what you sow. You say, well, uh, this has probably never happened to any of you, but it can happen to somebody. A child can turn a teenager or something like that, and a parent can say, you know, I don't think I like my kid. Really, something, stuff like that can happen. They're a teenager, they're doing, you know, they're doing all this wild stuff. What, it doesn't matter what they're doing. It's contrary to what you hoped for your kid. And they have an attitude towards you, a bad, bad attitude towards you as if you're the fault of everything. And a parent could actually look at their kid and go, I hate to say that, I hate to even think this, but I don't think I like my kid. Folks, you can't change everybody around you. Yes. But you can change your harvest. Ah, and there's a phrase. I'm going to read it to you. It's, it's the one that I wanted to give you today. Maybe, maybe if anybody has a pen or a notebook, or maybe you could write it in your Bible on Galatians um, 6, uh, above verse 7 or around that area. Um, if you could write it down, it might do you some good. Okay, it's very short. <clears throat> and it'd be good to put it in your Bible, if you could. Because what would, what would happen is, it might help you when you come back to these scriptures, um, like, 10 years from now, and God reminds you of what we talked about, and your whole life is a wreck. <laughs> yeah. You go, huh, maybe I should have listened to that guy. <laughs> All right, you ready? <clears throat> Let me read it first, and then, then I'll go slow and give it to you. So you, why don't you listen first? Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. All right, so here it goes. Write it down. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. <clears throat> One more time. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. <clears throat> All right. Now, let's consider the meaning real quick. And the, the meaning is this. <clears throat> the meaning assumes this, this little phrase, this, this sentence, it assumes that you've already got some bad seeds in the ground and some harvest is coming up, okay? It assumes that you haven't been perfect to this moment. Yeah. And that, you know, that, that you've already got some bad stuff coming and, you, and it might even be ominous to you. Do you see what I mean? It, it actually could. This statement could kind of have the sense of, oh my God, you know, I'm going to reap what I sow. There, there could be sort of a feeling of ominousness over that. So don't judge each day by the heart because it's, that is coming, 
but start judging differently. Instead of being under the burden of what's coming, change your approach. Change your view. Change your uh, mind in the matter. Um, there's, you can either be negative about the bad harvest and then keep doing what you're doing, and it's going to get worse. Can I get amen? amen? Or you can find a change, and this is a simple change here. Now, we have to remember, we have to remember, ultimately, it is a change where our hearts go back to the Lord because none of this is going to make any difference unless there, we say, you know what, I really need Jesus, and that's the biggest issue of all. Okay, as long as you know that. <clears throat> but if you know that, then you will do this for Jesus. And you will even say, hey, I, I'm willing to slap Jesus in the face or shove a spear in his side so it doesn't go into somebody else. He's willing for that. He is. He would rather, he'd say, look, that weak person, why do you beat them down so much? Hit me. I'm okay with it. I love you and I love them. But we've got our eyes off the cross and we've got our eyes off the nature of the Lord and we, we're just striking back. We're just sowing bad seed. We're just sowing corruption. We're sowing corruption. We're going to reap it in greater measure. <clears throat> All right. So, um, Uh, this this uh, next little f bit that I'm going to read here, I actually did write down before the New Year's Eve service. So this is a little bit of your New Year's Eve service that you missed out on. <clears throat> so I'm just going to read it. It's just a little bit here. A fresh start, because the New Year's usually, the New Year, don't we want sort of a fresh start? <clears throat> A fresh start begins with proceeding in fresh new ways of heart. Right? A true fresh start isn't just, you know, you know, saying I'm going to start new today. It is a fresh new ways of heart. It is not a new start if we enter the new year the same as all other years. It's not a fresh start if you Gonna, you fully intend on proceeding the exact same way that you did in every other year. That's not that difficult. Work with me, people. <laughs> to remove the old, to remove the old gives us the hope for a new beginning. But to remain in the old vanquishes any hope that a new beginning might come. What are we saying? If you, if there, you know, if there is a true dealing or removing of the old by bringing in the new, of course, then there's hope for a fresh new harvest, a fresh new life, a fresh new destiny, things that we could never imagine because the fruit and the abundance of the fruit of this harvest that comes by Christ has potentials that we can't even imagine. And it's, and it's glorious because it's him. All right. So to remove the old gives us hope for a new beginning. But to remain in the old, it vanquishes hope. It kills hope. It suffocates. And you can go several years and, and fake the new year. You know, do you understand what I'm saying, how I'm trying to? You can go several years and fake it. But eventually it catches up because it suffocates, because it, it slowly hope dies. And when hope dies, oh, my God, yes. that's, that's right. then you move into deep depression and, yes. you know, beyond that. All right. So if we continue holding grudges against others, then how can we hope for possibilities for change in the coming year? you just keep holding those same, same things, there's not going to be any change. I don't care what you say. I mean, you, can, you can believe all you want, and it's not going to change one thing. Because it's not about just sitting around believing stuff, thinking, well, maybe that'll pop something into existence. If you believe it, you act on it. 
If you believe you reap what you sow, you act on it. If you believe that you shouldn't judge each day by the harvest that you're reaping, but by the seed you plant, you'll start planting some other stuff. You'll, you'll, get, you'll be about that business. How can we hope for change when we remain unwilling to change? I mean, there is no change there. There is no change. I think, I think that was the thing. I think that was the situation with God looking at Israel before the Babylonian captivity. Yeah. Is that, that he'd sent prophets and he'd done everything he knew and there was no change. And he says, okay, okay, here comes the whirlwind. You sowed the wind, but you never get just the same amount of what you sowed. You always get a greater. So here comes the whirlwind. Now, here's the good thing. That's never the end of it. I mean, God, you, know, you, don't ha you know, you don't have to go down into Babylon and, and go through all that junk. But if, if, the, if you're not going to recognize the dealing of God in it, then you do have to go down. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and God will continue to deal with you. But you do realize, don't you, that even if God continues to deal with you, you get to a certain point and you lose hope then his words have no power anymore. I mean, you just feel like, you know, there's no, it's like being buried alive. <clears throat> All right, the new year brings with it a chance of finally bringing about change which we failed to reach in past years. All right, getting pretty close here. What is really needed, regardless of what we think we need, the real need is Jesus. We need Jesus, not everybody else. Yes. Not what others do. We need Jesus, and I can say that all I want, and you go, yeah, I know, you know, yeah, I need Jesus. Oh, my God, you need Jesus. I mean, you get, most of the time I say, we need Jesus. I know I need Jesus. You need to know you need yes. Jesus. There, we're, we are so deeply a mess, and yet we think we're doing good because we've feathered our nest in such a way that very little will conflict with us. Right. You know? We desperately need Jesus. And we need to go after him with all of our heart. We need to find that fresh, new warmth of, for, for the Lord. And st instead of him being up there and we go, I don't need you. I need your work. I need you to get down here and fix my spouse or fix my kids or fix my job or fix this. And why won't you do anything? Yeah. You're yelling at him because he won't jump through your hoops. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Instead of saying, man, I need you. I am messed up. That's right. That's What's that old, old spiritual? Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. That's, I need the Lord. I need a springtime, a new harvest, some warmth to rise on this cold land that is me. <clears throat> then I, I already said this earlier, but if our heart, I said this in two ways, or I'm about to say it in two ways. If our heart for Jesus is cold, our heart to forgive others will be cold. Do you believe that? Okay, now let's reverse it. If our heart to forgive others is cold, our heart for Jesus will be cold. Do you see, that? You see how that works? It really does. You can't get away from it. You cannot get away from it. You know, if, if we really want to get out of any kind of a situation into the warmth of the spring of the, to begin to bring forth the, the life that we can't, it just comes because the warmth finally comes. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, ask those people up north right now. They're dying for, for spring. It has been a rough winter. Why has it been so? Why is there no growth? Why is there no fruit? Why is there no flowers? What is wrong, God? I'll tell you what's wrong. It's just been too cold. It's been too cold for too long. But as soon as it starts warming up, life. You know? Coming into Crum, there's on the right hand side as you come in just before you get to the second train track, there's a big old pen that has sheep in it. Right now there's these little tiny lambs bouncing around all over the place. 
They're so cute. They're just playing and running, and they just, you know, and they just got life, and it's just new life, and you realize, you know, the winter's over, and that all the trees hadn't even budded yet, but life is budding, you know. Warmth. We need to get our hearts warm again for the Lord. Jesus said it ready to be hot or cold, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> um, if we don't see our offenses as hurting Jesus, violating his death, siding with the nature of his enemy, then we will only see our hurts, us treated unfairly, and our rights violated. Hmm. Should I read it again? If we don't see our offenses, meaning our frustration, our anger, our this, our that, or whatever, all the stuff, the allowance of these things, if we don't see those things as hurting Jesus, as violating his death, as siding with the nature of his enemy, then we're only going to see it as, I'm doing this because this is my hurts, because I have been treated unfairly, because my rights have been violated. And that's going to justify violating Jesus, because it's right. I'm right. They're wrong. I'm right. This is unfair. Okay. All right. You go with that. But I promise you, you're putting bad seed in the ground, and you, there's corruption coming for it. There is a consequence to pay if you just if you keep ignoring the laws of electricity or the laws of the harvest. <clears throat> I put we're caught up in ourselves. <clears throat> so last few sentences. Let us not just ring out the old year, but let us chase out the old ways of reacting and responding. In the new year, instead of continuing to be at war with those who hurt, those who fail, those who offend us, let us declare war against anything that's not Christ in ourselves. In place of wounding others and bringing them to tears, let us shed tears of longing to have Jesus formed in us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I long to be free from those things that have, I'm deceived about, those things that I allow because I think I'm right, I think they're, someone else is wrong. Help me not to be deceived. Help me to see how they are regularly in violation of you and, and they're literally me crossing over the line, standing next to the enemy, your enemy, joining in the way that he approaches things. I don't want to be opposite of you, Jesus. I don't want to be, I don't want to be so deceived that I would literally be spending the night in your the enemy's camp, your enemy's camp. And in the daytime, getting up and running around with you and acting like we're buds and we're chums. Lord, I can't see these things. Deception is just that way. We can't see it. But instead of seeing the deception of it, help us to see Jesus, Father. Because when we see him, that light that is him, the light of life will chase away darkness. Father, we do have so much unforgiveness, so much hurt. Lord, and we don't even realize that much of our dissatisfaction is not, is not what we think. It's not that person or the circumstance. It's the fact that we're so crossways with you, Jesus. We're so out of whack with you, Jesus. We're so far, we're so out of whack with you that we're dissatisfied because we're, we're not even in left field. We're not even on the playing field anymore. Holy Spirit, we need the breath of life breathed back into us. 
We need, we need everything that can be shook to be shook so that we'll have nothing else to, to accuse or to hold on to give us strength to look at other areas to accuse or other people to accuse. But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only hold in Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, we just speak words. I just preach and speak words. I'm an unworthy servant, but I do believe with all my heart that your people love you, that they want you more than they want things fixed. And yet, if they seek first, you'll add whatever needs to be there. I believe that the Holy Spirit is here, and not just here at this moment, but here to remind us, to bring to remembrance, not what Brandy preaches, not the unworthiness of a frail man, but the power of an endless life that can overcome the power of a life that can overcome. Lord, help us start by realizing that our hearts are cold. Our hearts are cold. And that we are in desperate need of, of finding that warmth, that springtime that is Christ, when his warmth comes within our soul and our being, not just our spirit where we see something new, not just our spirit where we see something fresh, but it breaks out of the Holy of Holies into the holy place and into the outer court and fills the spirit, soul, and body. Not teaching. Not just teaching. Not great teaching. Not God-given Holy Spirit breathed teaching. But Christ, finally through that rent veil, Oh, hallelujah. Making the, the holy place now one with the holy of holies, the dwelling place of God. Father, I just, I just believe that, I, that your spirit is here among us and that you're not speaking in vain. That you care so much for us. That Jesus, you've endured so much for a long period of time from us and you never said anything. You opened not your mouth. We sheared you. We slit your throat. But then we turned around and wanted to shear and slit the throat of others. That was our way. That's our, how we deal with things. We're quick to strike out instead of slow to speak. Lord, Lord, my words are just so empty compared to the truth of how far we really are from you. And that's why we are the way we are. That's why we're just reacting. We are not acting at all. We're reacting to everything. We're reacting to this and we react to that. We react to this. We never bring life into it. We never cover the nakedness of our brother or sister. We expose it and we want everybody else to see it so we can prove that they're wrong, they're bad, and we're the good one. We're the good one. We're the good one. But there's none good. There's none good. There's none like you, Jesus. When you died on that cross, you were the good, and yet you let everybody make you out to be the bad one. You did it out of love, and you did it okay. You were not. In fact, you, you did it so much, you just said, forgive them. I got them covered. Father, where is that Jesus in, in your 
in the body of Christ? Where is that living Jesus? Where is the Holy Spirit? Find him. Find him. He's lost in the church. He's lost in the church. Find him. Bring him out for us. That we may see him, not just see the teaching, see him in us. See him in one another. Father, with whatever, with whatever unction, however small it may be at this moment, we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us again our trespasses against Jesus, the very one we claim to love. Forgive us for our willingness to justify that which is not him in order to feel right or to bear what we call righteous indignation. And Father, we ask you to work in our hearts as we say we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus, you told us when we pray, pray this. And yet when we pray, we pray all the time things that sound so deep and spiritual. But we never pray, Father, forgive those who trespass against us. We forgive those who trespass against us. So, Lord, we, we look to the rest of this time, this period where you're dealing with us from now to the end of June. We know your dealing will go forever and ever. But we're talking about this concerted time. Lord, don't let us, don't let us reach the end of June and still not have at least tried to put some different seeds in the ground. Don't let us reach the end of June and not have said no to our flesh many times. Don't let us get to the end standing righteously on a hill declaring that life is unfair and people are unfair. And standing in our own righteousness, an abomination to you, but still thinking there's something good about us. Please, Father, we are so easily deceived. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Breathe on us. So I ask you, Lord Jesus, to gather us up into this last part of the journey of this time period of dealing to the end of June. Gather us up into this time period. And even if we don't see the harvest from the seeds that we sow of Christ, let us dedicate our heart not to be looking at the, the bad harvest that may be around us right now, but to be diligent, to put in the seeds of Christ now, between now and then, so that the end of June, we will know. We will reap if we faint not. We will reap if we faint not. We will reap of this good land. So we love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you so much. But we need you to save us from ourselves. Save us. Redeem the time now. Not just redeem us, redeem the time. Let the times be given to you diligently in heart and in prayer and in covering one another. Let us see instead of the enemy sitting around us in service or at home, the wounded and let us go over and put a covering over them and shelter them. Let Christ in us bear, bear the blows. And let you, Father, see your Son and be glorified. May it be a new day for you, not just for us. A new day of Christ. A new day of dawning. A 
new day of restoration, a new day of life. Hallelujah. Let's just stand together, if we would, please. <clears throat> if you would, just take the hand of somebody close to you. Make sure everybody's touching somebody else so that what we finalize here is flowing out of the vine into our branch and into other branches around us. We declare our oneness with you, Jesus. We declare that we are not of this earth. We declare that we are new creations by Christ Jesus. We declare that we want Jesus. We declare and renounce Satan. We declare and we renounce flesh as a viable thing to be sown. We reject, we reject our flesh just like it's the devil himself because it is, it sucks up everything and it sucks up wanting pity and it sucks up wanting all of the attention and it, and it cries and hurts and whines. It's like a bleeding thing that, that should have died a long time ago and we keep it alive and we preserve it and we pet it. We ask you, Lord, help us to see Jesus and be transformed into that image. We ask you not, uh, even in our holding of hands as, as, as members one of another, as one body that heal this body us that includes us but not us us not us individually but us the body of Christ help us to manifest the truth and no longer just talk about it help us father I believe father I do believe that that's what these people that you've added individually want. But now we're asking to take it to the next level, to it through this body. And may we no longer just be a body of believers, but the body of Christ. But the body of Christ. Father, that's for all those on Skype, for all those that will listen to this later, for all those that may watch this later. But Lord, if wherever your spirit is and wherever they are and whatever country or whatever situation they're in and whatever struggles they fight with and whatever things that would try to defeat them, that your spirit will be arising even now and flooding them with new hope. And that, Lord, they can go out of here and go away from listening to this and say there's hope in Jesus. There's hope in things that looked hopeless. There's hope in things that looked dark and satanic even and of the enemy that Jesus your light can bust that darkness and your life can break those chains and your son can be glorified in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation and so we we love you father you are our father we just want to be acting like your children we want you to see Jesus we want you to be happy father we want you to see Jesus in us. Grant it. Grant it. Grant it new ways and new days. Give us new ways and new days starting now. New ways and new days coming up. New ways and new days. We confess it. We confess it. We speak it forth because we sense your spirit breathing on it. New ways and new days coming up now. Hallelujah, Father. We have faith for one another, not just grabbing this for our own little pitiful lives, but for one another. New ways and new days for our brothers and our sisters. Lord, bring them joy and happiness and peace and bring them out of their darkness. Not us. Bring them out. Cover them, Lord, and give us the ability to cover them. And be, give us, Father, the fullness of light and life that is Christ so that we all rejoice in one and no man takes that glory unto himself. And so we ask you now, hear our cry and our prayer. 
we rest now to whatever degree that we can we rest now that you've heard and you're active and you're alive that your word is no longer dull sword but it's going to be sharp than any two-edged sword and it'll divide asunder our spirit from our soul and that'll that'll be just like that rending of the veil that sword will divide the spirit from the soul and the Christ that is filling the holy of holies will fill our soul oh thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord I'm asking you folks to believe it I'm asking you to believe it I'm asking you to believe that this is the Lord this is not another day. This is the Lord. This is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the cross, and this is the truth. I'm asking you to. I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to not do what we usually do when we break and we go hug one another. I'm asking you to go to different ones. Just put your arms around them. You don't have to. You can pray if you want, but I want you to put your arms around them and cover them and bear the bruises and the hurts that should be falling on them. And you let them fall on you and ask the Lord. Not You can do it outwardly or just in your heart. Lord, instead of them, this poor person being having these blows, let them fall on me by Christ and let me bear them by Christ, Father. So I ask you now, just Go to different ones and do that. Not to your best friends or whatever. To everyone that the Lord leads you to. Amen. Just do that and as we do, we'll be dismissed as the Lord finishes covering one another. In Jesus' name.